thousand students, usually around fifth grade, so this is a treat for us. They have older people. <laughs> uh, we, are, we have a guest speaker today, Rick Winslow, from the Game of Fish, he's a biologist, he studies uh, mainly cougars and bears. So, without any further ado, Rick. Um, so what I want to do is I'm just going to kind of go over how we, as a part of managing the bears through the population in the state, um, I move a lot, and I'm going to have to advance my slides by moving in front of this so if you can just run. Um, I have just a lot of information on this, and it can be a little dense, so I like to make it, I like to liven it up and make it interesting. If you have questions, call it out, don't raise your hand, because I'll just confuse people confused by this. Um, well, except you guys, you guys are here. <laughs> but um, just, just holler out a question if you have anything, if I'm going too quick, if something doesn't make sense. I have a few pictures. I was told recently that I needed to add more pictures to the presentation. And so I, I tried to add pictures, but some of them are a little strange. Um, tell me what you think about that. <laughs> 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 I put this in here because this is what we, people say, well, how dangerous are these animals? And, what do we do? If, what do we do if we see a bear in the woods? What do we do if we see a cougar in the woods? We always say, well, make yourself look big and hold a jacket out. <laughs> and, and, and it does work. It does tend to make the animal think twice about potentially attacking a larger animal. But it's also really funny for the cartoonists. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, black bear management I'd like to start with, and I'll be standing in front of you on half and half. What uh, we're looking at is we. From the period of about 1991 until about 2001, a lot of people questioned what we were doing as far as bear management. We didn't have any, any limits on our bear hunts. We weren't shooting a lot of bears in the state. And we were occasionally having droughts where we see a lot of bears come into town, come into areas like the, the Sandias here, and come into these, um, we call them urban wildlife interface, or urban wildland interfaces, the places where people are living in wildlife habitat, in bear habitat. And so what we wanted to determine is what is going on with the bear population? What are they doing? What does a bear in New Mexico need? And what can we do to figure this out? So we, we did this big study. We caught a whole bunch of bears, put radio collars <laughs> on. People followed them around and bothered them a lot. <laughs> um, they, you know, this, this is probably bothers the bears quite a bit when you go and try and find it every couple of weeks. Climb into a den with it, poke it with a dart, put it to sleep, measure its kids, poke everybody again, give them another ear tag, possibly change the radio collar out, catch them inside their lips. Very miserable experience. But what, what we found out about this is bear populations require a number of things. You know this fundamentally, but you still have to ask the question and try to answer the question. So, we harvest a certain number of bears. A certain number of bears are killed in the state. They get run over on roads. They get into trouble. We have to remove them from the population. Um, they die naturally. Weather is a huge factor in this. How much weather do you have? If you have weather, a year like this where we haven't had a whole bunch of weather is not as good as a year where we had a lot of weather. And then the habitat, which is also really dependent on that moisture that you get from the winter system, from the winter storm systems, and from the monsoon systems in the summertime. So what do bears eat? Anything we can't run away from them is essentially the answer to this. Um, early in the year right now, they eat a lot of grass, they eat insects, they dig up ant hills, they eat ants, they tear apart logs, they roll over boulders, eat whatever they find under the fence and get away. Fortunately, those little things aren't very fast. <laughs> um, then they start eating the fruit and the, and the vegetables, essentially, that, that, that are developed um, later in the summer, particularly with the beginning of the monsoon rains and ripening fruits, berries, there's wild strawberries. We don't have a lot of berries in New Mexico, but we do have some, and the bears eat a lot of things. There's a, there's a species a plant called bear corn that's very popular in this mountain range. Um, and then what they're waiting for is the best time of the year when the acorns become ripe, the pinion nuts, the juniper berries, the prickly pears. That's when the bears fatten up for the winter. Um, so I, I, I sort of follow the slides, read them. What does mast mean? Mast, well, mast is sort of a, it's a broad category. It means all of the plant food that's produced. So, 
acorns, berries, apples would be considered masts. There's soft masts and hard masts. The soft masts are any of the fruits, whereas the hard masts are nuts, like pinion nuts, too. Or pin pinion nuts and uh, acorns. <laughs> I didn't make the word up. <laughs> I, I, I actually know, you know, at some point in, in the past, somebody said, rather than just say food, we're going to say mass, and so we're going to confuse people. <laughs> Are they too fast for them? For the most part. Now, um, if, if they if they dig up a, a mouse nest or something like that, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna eat them. And mice are not that quick. And if, you you will see bears in the middle of a meadow, and you've seen the pictures of coyote or fox out there hunting mice. Um, <clears throat> bears do the same thing, but usually they're not after mice. They're after grasshoppers because they will eat a lot of grasshoppers. Because grasshoppers aren't that quick and they're really dumb. <laughs> so in, uh, in human dominated areas, the bears tend to eat sort of a different diet. They take a lot of the apples that, that fall off to the ground that, that nobody gets, it's mostly later in the year. Um, but earlier in the year, bird season is a huge temptation for bears. It's very, it's very nutritious. It's high in fats, high in protein. And people go, oh, that's not enough. Bears aren't going to be, well, they do. They love bird feeders. They knock them over. And unfortunately, we have to deal with the bears when we do that. Garbage. Everybody knows garbage is bad for bears. Um, pet food, people feed pets on the porches. So basically what happens is that in a in human dominated environment, bears will use us as as a, the, they subsidize their diet, their natural diet, through food that we produce for them. So how to avoid problem bears. Go through all those things. Don't feed birds, don't feed birds, feed them in the winter. Or take your bird feeders in at night because the bears are more active at night, particularly in places where there's a lot of people. Any food that falls on the ground, everybody up here has apple trees. Apples, bears love apples. They they come in and they eat all the apples that you don't pick up on the ground, and unfortunately then they're there. And then when you bring the garbage out the next night, they also knock over the garbage. Once they learn these behaviors, it's very hard for them to unlearn them. So we and moving the bear is really not an option most of the time. You can move them, but you're just moving the problem somewhere else, and bears will travel a long ways to come back. Um, we just say don't feed bird seed, bird, bird, bird seed during the summertime. They don't need it. There's plenty of wild seed out there. Bring on your bird feeders in at night. Bring your bird feeders in at night. Um, keep a clean environment. Piles of stuff in the yard. I said bears eat ants and bugs and things like that. Well, if they can, you know, if you have a wood pile, there's ants and bugs in the wood pile. So they'll just push the wood pile over, doing exactly what they do out in the woods, rolling logs and things like that. Because those ants are in your yard too. Um, feed pets inside. Barbecue grills are a huge thing. Everybody has a barbecue grill in the yard. I have a barbecue grill in the yard. I don't think it doesn't count. <laughs> but up here, you really should be bringing it into a garage or an outbuilding or something like that. Because all of the, when you cook that steak, it leaves a lot of steak residue on there. And the bird really likes steak residue. I like steak residue. <laughs> so, uh, population. We found over, over the course of the study that we did that bears had their first cup 4.7 years. Since that time, with an additional 13 years of data, we're finding that our bears are really breeding at 3.7 years. So our four-year-old bears are having cubs. Um, that's the average age of the first birth. That's good. What it means is that our bears are happy. They're, they're in a happy place as far as bears go. There's happier places. The East Coast, they have much higher numbers of food crops. There's a lot more nut trees. There's a lot more berries. There's a lot more wild fruit. And they actually start breeding at three years there. Um, but here, four years is good. They will breed every two years, approximately, depending on you know, everything going right. Um, it takes a female bear a couple years, for about 18 months. She has the cubs in the den in December and January, keeps them with her all summer long, and they go into the den with her the next year. And then at the end of that hibernation cycle, she kicks them loose and goes to find a new boyfriend. <laughs> um, so what we get, the total recruitment of this is each year, each female bear produces about a half a cup. Four times that. So, and, and like this says, litter interval, 1.8 years, that's every two years. Um, it, when, when we have acorn failures or we have a food failure, two years ago, there was a very bad frost in the spring here. Um, there was no acorns produced. 
there was, there was, there was that, it killed the apple trees, it killed everything, everything died. Um, there was no food that year, and there was very little cubs last year because of that. This last year we had very good food resources in the fall, and so we'll probably have a lot of cubs this year with the drought and the potential for continued drought. I think we're going to see a number of bear problems this year, probably quite a few. Um, bears live 25 years in the wild. Every year we have 25 year old bears harvested. Um, we take a tooth from the bears and send it off each year. Each one of the bears is harvested, each one of the bears that we have to kill because it's been doing something really obnoxious like tearing through somebody's garage door or something like that. Um, and they're usually going through the garage door to get to the steak residue on that grill. Most bears have, have a very high probability of surviving. If they make it through the first year, 50% of the bears die in the first year. All these little cute bear cubs, unfortunately, don't last well. They get away from mom, everything will eat them. They're not very, they have sharp ends, but they're not very good at using them. Um, if what's, what's your, this picture, oh sorry, I, I keep forgetting about it. I have all these crazy pictures in here. This picture is actually on Earthland Airport Fix. And what this is, it's a wildlife drinker, and that is a bear availing itself of the fact that it's nice and cool and wet. <laughs> um, and I, that picture, I guess, it was taken in July or something like that. It's actually a pretty good-sized bear. Um, so bears, if they, if bear cubs, if they make it first year, they're probably going to make it. They have a 75% probability of surviving from then on. Older males, males get in more trouble. They fight each other. They fight over females. They fight over strange things, they move around a lot, they cross roads, they tear open garage doors, they can get the drill. So they, they don't last as well as females. Females are going to live. Naturally, 10% of the bear population dies every year, keeping balance, the natural balance, essentially. But most of the mortality, besides um, basically old age, is because of us, for one way or another. How do you age the bear food? I send it to a lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tree rings. They essentially, it's just like tree rings, yeah. They, they, they have a number of processes that go through, but bears grow continuously throughout their life, unlike us. And they put on a new layer of deadly. When they hibernate each year, they actually build muscle up. These things are, I wish I could do this. They go to sleep, they build muscle, they lose weight, their teeth get stronger, their bones get, everything's good for them. Unfortunately, I take a nap and I just get older and fat. <laughs> so, how do we kill bears? We run them over. That is, it's a huge source of, of mortality for bears in New Mexico, and in most places where there's a lot of people in a reasonable number of bears. We run them over. They cross roads, they're moving. These are animals that need a big area to move around and get enough food. And so, when, and in an area like this, we have a lot of bear habitat, a lot of people, a lot of roads. Unfortunately, a lot of bears get run over. Hunter harvest is the largest single source of mortality for bears. We harvest about 500, 600 bears a year. Um, and then removal for nuisance activities can be a significant source of mortality. Some years are a lot higher than others. Last year was a decent food year, but we still removed a lot of bears statewide for one reason or another. And that what that just tells us is that we have a good, strong bear population because there's plenty of food out there, yet there's still bears getting into trouble causing trouble in some people's minds, which means that, that we have a good, strong bear population. So, I have a question about, you said removal for nuisance activities. Don't they just take them to another place, or where do they go? Removing bears and moving them to another place, kind of locating them, is, or should, is, has been shown over and over to be fairly ineffective. Um, we're either moving the bear there and getting it's going into an unfamiliar place, an unfamiliar population of other bears, because we're not going to put it somewhere that a bear can't make it. They get into a lot of trouble with those other bears. Um, basically, they don't they, do that anymore? Well, we, we, we do move some. We, there's, it's, it's basically, we don't have a three strike. You used to hear about the three strike yeah. system. We really don't use that. It's, it's based on the behavior of the bear. What's the bear doing? OK, if the bear is just in your yard eating apples, we're going to move him once. He's not doing anything bad. However, if he's eating trash, we know that this is a bear that's going to come and eat trash somewhere else, and we're probably going to have to, we're going to have to kill that bear. What, if you move him, do you tag him or something? Yeah, we put it, we put it here, tag him. 
And unfortunately, we've had, we've moved bears to Grant, and I swear they beat me back here. <laughs> question is the size, two questions, one is the size and weight of an adult, and is there an alpha bear in a given, like in the coyote population, that does all the breeding in a given Yes setting? and no. Um, bears are promiscuous and polygynous, meaning that the female will breed with more than a male. Um, and oftentimes they've done genetic studies on the cubs, and three cubs in one female bear all come out at the same time, three different fathers. So, <laughs> They, you know, if they have the opportunity, they, they're, spreading, they're spreading the genes around, which is good. It's good for the bear population. Um, but you, yeah, you'll have a dominant male, and he's usually the biggest one who can knock the most heads together. Um, that doesn't mean he wins. It just means he's, it's the show off that he's the, the alpha male in the group. And size range, an average size female bear is about 180 pounds. Average size male is probably 250. That can be really big. We have old female bear females that are 100 pounds. We have old males that, and old females that go up to 400 pounds. Um, a bear in, in, an, in, in one year can fluctuate 150, 200 pounds based on real, a lot of acorn, really excellent food resources in the fall. They'll put on 150 pounds. We don't like that, but it works really well for bears. What's their height when they stand? Pardon? With their height. They are erect. The, good question. I don't know. They, you know that what the erect posture you see when the bear's standing up and looking like this, mm -hmm. it's not a threat thing. They're trying to figure out. Okay, they, they, it gets them off the ground. They can smell better. They don't see very well, so they're up there smelling. And they stand up when they're curious and they're a little scared. They're standing up trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Then when they get back down, that's more normal for them to have that that four-legged. Uh, Look. <laughs> All right, so the bear study that I keep mentioning, we found some basic facts throughout the state. Males have large home ranges, 60 to 150 square miles. The Sandias are, I, I, I've done this and I always forget the number, they aren't very many square miles in this, the whole Sandia range, but we have a lot of bears in it. Um, in the southern part of the state, the home ranges tend to be larger than the north. They're not strongly territorial. That's your, your alpha male question. The coyotes are very strict. Nobody's allowed in my gambler. Bears will share the same food resources. The only time bears compete is males for females. And that's May June, essentially. And that is the time of year when you see a lot of strangeness in the bear community. Um, they will move a long ways to uh, an isolated food resource. I don't know how they know it, but Occasionally, every darn bear on this mountain knows that there's a lot of acorns in Doc Long, and so they're all there. Um, <laughs> I, I chased them out of there. I went out there with a rubber buckshot and a shotgun and a shot full of bears in five minutes. I mean, it's, they, they all know every bear on the mountain goes there. So, how much habitat in the state? This is New Mexico. The forested areas, as you can see, are bear habitat, and there's bears in all of them. Um, not very many here. <laughs> but there's bears in, in all of these areas. Um, we're finding that there's bears in a lot of other areas too. White sand moose range right here. There we have breeding populations of bears in the white sand moose range in the San Andres and the Escura Mountains on the moose range, which is that's new information. We're just kind of we knew that there were bears there occasionally, but they started camera trapping and putting the stuff up. There's females with cubs, and there's a happy little bear situation down there. They're not a lot of bears, but there's a bunch of them. It's Interestingly enough, a number of them have ear tags in their ears. <laughs> um, it's a fashion statement of some kind. But the, the, green hat, the green color is the best habitat. The yellow color is okay, and the brown color is not as good. However, seasonally, bears will expand out of these areas. Um, this, is, this does not include all the pinyon and juniper habitat in the state by any stretch of the imagination. On a good juniper or on a good um, pinyon year, you can have bears all over the place harvesting, foraging on pinyon nuts. Do you ever pick up a bear that's gone, say, the Sacramento Mountains up to the San Juans? Or how far do they travel? Good question. Um, yes, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, you know, natural movement. If they're not being pushed, we're not moving or something like that. We've had bears go, we have bear 
about two years ago. They going back to Colorado right above the correctional loop to there. <laughs> and they came back to his, his same home range the next year. <laughs> and, but think about this. On the way back, okay, so he hibernated there. He didn't get back until June or something like that, which means that when he was up there near Canyon City or somewhere in between there and here, the May June breeding period, this was a mature male, he was out spreading his genes about somewhere up in Colorado. So it was an interesting movement, and we see that kind of thing fairly regularly. So we look at how many bears are there based on how much habitat we have, and what, how many bears we think there should be in any given bit of land because of the densities that we determined from the study. We say, okay, there's, there should be somewhere between 9.4 and 17 bears for every 100 square kilometers of decent bear habitat. If you do the math, it brings you to 5,300 to 6,500 approximately. We're finding out with newer techniques and newer studies, they're using a lot of non-invasive genetic techniques to determine how many bears are out there. Um, those numbers are low, is what it's, it's looking like. Um, we, don't, we haven't got the results fully from ours yet, um, but both Arizona and Colorado are using the same techniques, found that they had bear densities twice as high as they thought they were. They were using the same bear densities as this because that study was the best at the time. Newer studies are showing that there's more bears out there. I sometimes don't understand how they exist because it doesn't seem like there's room for them, there's food for them, but bears are very good at what they do. Well, how do you count? You can't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just it. So what we're doing, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're leaving things that bears like out there on the landscape. Um, we're putting barbed wire around a number of trees around them. Bears come through, it pulls the tuft of their hair out, and we can bring that back and determine what bear that is using genetics techniques. So how many do you estimate are in the same? I don't like to use that number. <laughs> <laughs> There's some bears in the Sandias. <laughs> how many bears are you actually tracking that you have radio collars in? Right now, we have, in the whole state, I, we have, I want to say half a dozen up out of Lionel and Bermeo Park. Um, and we're, and we're looking at those in conjunction with an elk calf mortality study. It turns out bears eat a lot of elk calves. <laughs> elk hunters, elk biologists, they don't like that. <laughs> so uh, I, I think statewide we might have eight bears with radio collars on. We have one on the San Diego, we have one of the Mazanos, and I think another six up there. But there, it's really not a bear study so much as we're trying to look at how uh, how these bears are related to human habitat. Human do you have, like, with tattoos that you could identify the bear? Most of the, most of the tattoos that we put on, most of those, we're starting to see those bears, those are 25 year old bears, a lot of them. Oh, okay. they're, they're getting toward the age of, the end of their born on day, let's just say. Um, but this is in a chart I threw up because it's very interesting to me, and it's part of my master's thesis. But um, if you look at these, these peaks in, uh, which is which, Precipitation, they interestingly, and what it is is there's a lag time, they correspond to bear mortality. You have very high precipitation, it, it seems like it's corresponding to bear mortality, that's not what's going on. You have a lag time that's going on because of the low precipitation. About a year later, you end up having high bear mortality. I was trying to show how droughts and the bear population and what they're doing didn't work at all. <laughs> But it looks neat. <laughs> and when I tried to do it scientifically, it didn't work at all. Here is our standard bear. Um, we caught him just off of South 14. I like just off of South 14, so just on the other side of the He was doing something. So we put this earring on him. This is a this is also on, on Kirkland Air Force Base. It, it, this is in David Canyon, so you know it's from here, it might be six miles to this, this location. Um, yeah, as the crow flies, as you walk further complex, big highway in the um, a lot of rocks, sharp things. It's a big, heavy, healthy male bear. Um, this is a spring picture. No, sorry, an October picture. Um, but he's in really good shape there. You can see he's wonderful and happy. We saw that bear on this same camera all in wrong. He never went to sleep. He never did, and we could tell. He showed up in the middle of winter, showed up, showed up, showed up. 
The next April, he was hit by a vehicle on South 14, right by Oak Flats, um, which is unfortunate. Beautiful bear. He's actually black. They're, these are all black bears here, and this one's black. Very rare. <laughs> Talking about South 14 and all that. When, a number of years ago, when I-40 was reworked, some of us were involved in a project to clear the underpasses. Right. So the animals would use the underpasses instead of hitting the fences. Did that work? They seem, you know, bears go through there and cougars go through there on a regular basis. I don't think we figured out exactly where yet, but they're going through. The, the main place, as far as I can tell, is uh, the underpass that is. Uh, Oh, right there west of Paris. The one that goes in and it goes up to... Yep. Yeah, I can't... Not, not down as far as that but they cross there too. Um, there's, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a big culvert down there that cougars use, bobcats use, foxes use. You're going to do My bears probably do, but not documented for sure. The big underpass down in, in Cunningwell, they definitely use that. The smaller one up higher, they're using that. The deer don't like it because they don't they don't like that cement substrate. Um, but the one that there's actually a road through it. It's, it's not you know it's not the main Harris one, but the one just to the west of there by the school. Bears and cougars are using that regularly, um, and especially after that fence. That fence that they put up works. It keeps the animals off the road. So he would say for considerations get back to the point of some of this. <laughs> Try not to create bear habitat in your yard and you won't have problems with bears in your yard. Um, if approached by a cougar or a bear, stand up, don't run a whole lot of your jacket, and they'll laugh at you. You'll know they're doing it, but do it anyways. Don't run away from them. Yes. <laughs> Very good question. I don't know. Hold your backpack. You have a backpack. So you hold up your backpack. It makes you look bigger. Take your shirt off and hold it up. Yeah. Trying to outrun your brother. I think it's your mom. Mom's going to Paul. Everybody has a big group and then look like a bear. I don't know. Yeah. Don't run. Running fast. That's what the one of the main things we're fighting out. People who run. You run, unfortunately, you look like the little prey species is running away, and there where the cougar is going to go, it's running on the edge. And they do, and that's bad. Um, so if the approach, if the animal continues to approach you, yell, bang, pot, and hand spit, you're probably not going to have pot. Yeah. Yeah. Pick up a stick, throw a rock at it, whatever, and then we, what we say is if they, it's been shown over and over again that if you're attacked by a black bear or a cougar, fight back. Probably gonna make it. If you don't fight back, you're not gonna make it. Simple as that. And so cougars, which you're also here, a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of cougars just in this local area. Um, we have issues with them every year. They come into people's yards and eat their head go. <laughs> chase them around for a while, they usually get away. Um, they eat dogs occasionally, same thing. But we had a big study also on cougars down in the on the White Sands Missile Range in the San Andreas Mountains. Over a uh, 10 year period, lots of cougars were caught, followed <coughs> them around, they kept them constantly irritated. They did a lot of things to them. And part of what we, they found in that study, we use as part of our cougar management, but that was a while ago, and things are not as good as. <laughs> So this is a neat picture, same area down here on Kirtland, you know, it's just, just over there. <laughs> Mom, cougar, two pretty big kittens. Um, and that's one of those wildlife figures they got in there. So they breed at a couple years of age. Um, as soon as the as a female cougar is independent from her mother, she's probably got a boy friend, or at least a boy interested. They can breed all year long, they can have kittens all year long. They have two to four cubs. 75% of females are involved in breeding activity annually, is what that means. They're, 50% of them have cubs every year. Um, a baby cougar passes or goes away from its mother somewhere between a year and 18 months of age. Some male cougar kittens tend to stick around a little bit longer. They live eight to 12 years. 
mortality in the cougars is primarily humans, but if we were doing it, the other cougars would be doing it. They don't get along. But it's, as Abraham Lincoln once said, no matter how much cats fight, they always seem to keep winning kittens. <laughs> Oh good, that's, yeah, I didn't even realize I had some cool graphics in there. <coughs> now this is a cool one. How many cougars can you count? <laughs> There's another version of this where there's three. I just couldn't get it. It didn't come out well in the slide. This is right south of Highway 380 in the Los Angeles Pass. Well, that's a real grab right there, or a real sand. <laughs> um, mother cougar, two big, big kittens. These are, you know, they're, they look as big as mom. So they may be both two male kittens. Um, oh, okay. neat thing about those cougars down there, they eat vegetables, they can't eat them at all. So, eat a lot of stuff. The cougars down there on Bosque del Apache, crane, Duck, goose, beaver, carp, <laughs> oryx, javelina, there's deer and elk, so they eat those too. They eat weird stuff. Bullfrogs, they documented them eating bullfrogs. I don't know, they're crazy. The same female with the kittens, and apparently they, they noticed the camera, and it got caught in the flash at that point. How many cats do we have? Not as many as bears. We have uh, a good number of cats, however, in the state, and once again, I can't count them. <laughs> They're even harder to count than bears. Um, based on the amount of habitat we have in the state, and based upon a lot of educated guessing, let's call it, parts of the state provide not as good cougar habitat, parts of the state provide no cougar habitat, and parts of the state provide really good cougar habitat. Females have big home ranges, males have really big home ranges. Each male home range usually overlaps with three or four female home ranges, um, or more or less, depending on how it's apportioned across the landscape. Um, there's a lot of cougars. Do you see them? No. Um, never, <laughs> in most cases. Um, you, you know, you're very lucky if you see a cougar. They realize, and people say, well, there, there must not be very many because I'm not seeing them. Realize that this is an animal that lives by the art of not being seen. They eat other animals. So when they get, when they get seen, they're like, they're like ninjas. When they hear you, you fail. So when, you're, when you're, you're seen, you fail. And this is one of the things, and there's studies going on in this. It's very interesting. Um, cougar attacks, they happen. <clears throat> Cougars do eat people. We've had it happen in New Mexico in the last few years. We had a kid attack on this mountain. Um, but they have shown that if, if a cougar is attacking and you, if you look at it, it stops. Because this is what they do when a deer looks at it, it freezes. And it's a bush. <laughs> so uh, when, when, they, when they attack and you look at it, they stop. However, if you look away to run or something like that, we're not saying to use this. Um, I, the obligatory art. So this is where cougars live in New Mexico. Um, you guys all get deeds. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it's blue, there's probably not cougars there. They pass through it occasionally. They're using it to go somewhere else. But all of the red, yellow, and green colors, there is some cougar habitat there. It may not be a lot of cougar habitat. They may not be breeding there, but they may be going there occasionally, usually males going through. Males move a lot, females not so much. But there are some of these areas we're finding have more and more cougars, which you have to remember is that us, humans as a species, so ever since we came west, um, particularly white humans, and the, the European colonial, colonial period, we decided that cougars, bears, and all these things are very bad and killed everyone we saw. And then we spent the next 150, 200 years trying to kill the rest of them because they do bad things. They eat our cows, they eat our sheep, they eat our dogs. So we spent a lot of time trying very hard to kill all of them. Um, we were unsuccessful at this. Good. I'm glad. 
is that we would be a we would be a lesser we'd have a lesser experience if we didn't have some of these animals out there still. Um, but we're finding that the cougars have been expanding. And even in the past 10 years, there are more cougars out of here. The Chicken Carry area, we have regular cougar situations out there. Um, one of our game commissioners was recently in a situation with a cougar. Um, he was chewed up pretty well. Um, now, it was, they were cougar hunting. There was a dog involved. There was maybe don't get in between them. Don't fight. But they, cougars live in, they live in places where there's something to cover them. They're not going to be in a flat, open desert. If there's a flat, open, there's an arroyo going through the flat, open desert, and it's very brushy in that arroyo, you could have a cougar there. They have somewhere to hide. They have somewhere to maybe jump out and get the deer or, or the animal. Um, so they live in difficult landscapes, landscapes that have some, something going on. There's bushes, there's rock, there's trees, there's a little bit of sinuosity. There's, little arroyos, there's little ditches, things, places to hide. Um, they live in, we say, mule deer and deer, mule deer and elk range, but they eat other stuff. As I said, um, we have places where there's no mule deer, no elk, and there's lots of food. And I still don't know what they eat. Well, is, it, is it true that they kind of like bighorn sheep if they get sheep? It's not that they like bighorn sheep, it's that bighorn sheep are really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the joke amongst biologists and most sheep people is that every sheep, big horn sheep, domestic sheep, every one of them is born looking for a place to die. <laughs> um, cougars eat big horn sheep, they're not typical prey. Um, they live in difficult habitat, which is why they don't kill more of them. Now we are and we actively remove cougars from these desert ranges where we have big horn sheep populations. Um, and that's how we managed to recover that. <coughs> is there a chance to like, reintroduce the big ones from San Diego? Those are Rocky Mountain big ones. Oh. Um, that's, they're different than the desert subspecies. Um, I don't think it's on the books at the moment. However, we are looking at reintroducing desert big one sheep to the southern end of the Sacramento down here. Those giant canyons up above Alamo Gordo, right? And that's um, we got a lot of other questions to answer before we can do that. But San Diego, I'm not the one that's not a flat word. But they were here, right? Well, they were here 15 years ago. There was still a few, anyways. Um, but I am, and that population went out. The problem with the San Diego is that too many people. Um, big horn sheep are very, they're not resistant to diseases. So many people, dogs, etc. They get up there, they have interactions. The big horn sheep can get pneumonia from a dog and die. Like I said, looking for a place to die. So, this was a big male that um, he did something unfortunate. This is a, it's actually a pecan orchard down near, oh, you know where Picacho is, near Picacho. Um, he was eating goats or sheep or something like that, and, and they had to kill him. But it's just showing that you know we have we have to deal with these animals in a situation like that on a pretty regular basis. This is he was a biologist who worked for us many many years ago, and he's now the sergeant out of the Chalmers district. No way. Yeah. No, I don't know. He's still with us. Is there a color differentiation between males and females? No. Uh, the scientific name is puma con color, which is basically means one color. Uh, they're, that, they're all that sort of tawny color. Now there's variations. Some are a little bit more red, some are a little bit more brown. Um, we're off, we always, oh, one of the things in my existence in the position is that we all are constantly getting black panthers. <laughs> there ain't no such critter. <laughs> there are no black cougars. There never has been. They've never even found Melanism is when, a, when an animal is black. That should be there with you because it's like the same as albino, just the reverse. Um, there's never been a melanistic cougar reported, ever, anywhere. But it's not true that the males can be darker. No. Um, one of the things people, and I think this is black panther thing coming from this, is a lot of people see them at night running in front of the car real quick. That's where you saw the, the cougar, yeah, right across the, the car. They look dark at night, it's dark at night. Um, but no, they're, they're virtually indistinguishable. 
Um, they've had an interesting management history, as back in the old days, the good old days, as some people call them, they had a bounty against them, and you can go shoot a cougar and somebody pay money for that. Um, for a long, and the bounty, depending on where you were, there were cattle growers associations in, in different counties that paid a lot more than $5. $5 was the, the territorial bounty, actually, if we were a territory until 1912. Um, but there were cattle growers associations who would be like, the, the lower Gila cattle, cattle growers associations will offer $20 for the head and ears of any food. So, you know, crazy things. Um, they suspended the bounty that did not allow the protection for quite a while, 1923 through 1970. And from that point, from 71, they were protected. And the seasons have become increasingly liberal since then, essentially because the cougars have spread all over the place. They were there in, in very low numbers in most of these places before, but they have they regained a lot. We harvest a lot of them. No. We sport harvest on cougars is about 200 animals annually. They're very hard to catch. You can't just go out there. It's not like deer hunting. They're not going to be in predictable places. You can't go out there and anticipate shooting one of these animals. You can call them in. You can use dogs to pursue and catch and then shoot them. But you're not going to go out there and shoot a cougar. It just doesn't happen. So, zone management, we went to a system much like our bears were. Each area, each portion of the state, each one of these is a zone, and we allow, in order to sustain, we don't want to kill off all the cougars. We like the cougars, they do good things. We don't like them being big ones sheep. We would prefer they not eat deer, but they do, and they're gonna. Um, some people really object to this. Most of us realize that they're gonna eat deer, it's what they do. But, each one of these portions of the state, you're allowed to take a certain number of cougars out to maintain a population at some level. We determine the level. Um, we say if you kill this many total animals or this many females, you're not allowed to hunt anymore. So there's very few of these zones that get killed. This one closes every year. The thing about cougar hunting is that the best way to catch cougars is when there's snow, so you can see where it went. It snows a lot up here. <laughs> so those areas where there's snow, they harvest a lot, but the areas where there isn't, they don't. For instance, here's the hounds, this big animal, that's a big guy, and that's a big animal. Um, okay, so, once again, um, female, 90 to 100 pounds. Male, full grown animals. Um, but that can go up to 120 pounds and down to 70 pounds. Um, a male, full grown, probably 110 to 140. They're not huge. However, you know, this, is, this looks like it's probably a 180, 200 pound animal. Um, and, and people shoot them that big every year or they run over. This animal obviously also, he just, he just had a bunch of deer. <laughs> 50, 60 pounds of deer. He's, you can tell he's full. Total statewide harvest has kept up over the years. Um, we remember that we didn't start hunting until 1971. Um, it's gone up over the years. This year, we still, our sport harvest is right here. And it stayed, it stayed there for quite a few years now. This other 100 animals, we've removed them from big orange sheep habitat. We've removed them from people's chicken feeds. <laughs> we've removed them from other areas. We very seldom relocate cougars, unfortunately, because they are even in more trouble when you move them somewhere else. The other cougars in that area are going to do bad things to them. <laughs> Harvest variable, once again, snow. If you got a lot of snow, pretty easy to catch cougars with dogs. Um, how much effort is put for? This isn't easy. You, you let the dogs go, and they chase this thing, you have to follow the dogs. Um, the guiding industry. That's how most of the cougars are harvested. Um, there's these guys that maintain these packs of hounds, um, and they charge people to go out there and catch cougars. And they charge them to bring them out to show them where they help out, et cetera, et cetera. Incidental harvest. We don't have a lot. That's, I personally purchase a, I, I hear about that I elk hunt, and I purchase a cougar tag every year, and I have never shot a cougar. Um, but I have a pack, just in case. <laughs> Um, the harvest in that year, in that particular <coughs> area, cougars replace their population very quickly. About 18 months, for if you kill all the cougars in an area, in 18 months there's going to be new cougars there. 
Um, there's always a lot of young animals on the landscape moving around trying to find a place to live. Um, so if you, how many big nails you killed the year before is going to affect how, many, how the harvest is going to work in that particular given bit of territory. And then avoidance of female harvest. We have taught the hunters over time that if you want to continue to be able to harvest these animals, don't shoot girls. <laughs> this, <laughs> we joke about this. I, I you know, add pictures. I add his picture. <laughs> a really bad picture in this case. Uh, we, we, we've been wondering, okay, is this a captive animal or is this thing stuffed? <laughs> it, it, it was like 1930 and it's in an old book and I, I saw it and I just thought, oh, this is hilarious. I've got to put this in the <laughs> Economic importance. We sell about 2,000 wine bags annually. That doesn't mean much. It's not very much money. However, the guiding industry, these guys that come from Pennsylvania to come shoot a cougar, because there aren't any cougars in Pennsylvania, they spend a lot of money for local businesses. They got to get here airlines, hotels. It costs approximately $4,000, $5,000 for them to pay the guy to bring them out for two or three days to kill a cougar. So they spend a lot of money, and it costs a lot, and they bring a lot of money into the state. And we spend about, this is 